Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Winona Howder. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm glad to be back. Well, I've been an admirer of your work. You're the executive director of something called Food and Water Watch, a, a public advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. Before we get into your books, tell us about your background. Well, I have been working in the public interest now for almost 40 years. Eleven years ago, we formed Food and Water Watch to really develop a grassroots component to advocacy. Because before then, you'd been working with um, Ralph Nader's Public Citizen Group. Yes, I worked there for almost 10 years doing advocacy around energy and food issues. And we saw that politics had really changed We no longer live in a time like when Ralph could walk into Congress, work with some congressional uh, advocates, and get good legislation passed. We realized that we really need to have grassroots advocacy and organizing, and that's why we created an organization that has 16 offices around the country now. And We also have an office in Brussels, and we wanted to work on the life and death issues around water and food and, of course, energy production really affects uh, both of these important resources. Well, uh, I'm so interested that your background, your academic background is in anthropology. That's right. I have an uh, undergraduate degree in sociology, and when it was time to go to graduate school, I was already doing uh, public interest work, and I thought, I already know a lot about public policy, but really what we're talking about is human culture and how it reproduces Mm -hmm. itself, and how do we change that? So I went and got a degree in applied anthropology. Well... The, the, you first, I've, I followed you through Food and Water Watch, but when you came out with this book, Foodopoly, The Battle Over the Future of Food and Farming, this is an extraordinary work. You, you, and food and water is so important for our health. So tell me about the, um, what you did in this book and how long it took. I want, want people to know that your research is phenomenal. There are huge sections of everything you've quoted, the citations for it, footnotes. You'll never walk alone in this book. You'll know where every fact came from. Go ahead. Well, I was really concerned because of our work at Food and Water Watch with how do we change our dysfunctional food system? And I thought that going back and looking at the history of how we have gotten here and then Um, looking at some of the things that we need to change. And we know that in light of climate change that we must have a more resilient kind of food system. And that part of the problem is we have just a few agribusiness and big food companies that really control production and that it's very difficult for farmers to make a living. And so Foodopoly was really about how we can vote with our fork but also vote with our vote in order to really correct the structural problems that are keeping us from having a good food system. And so some of the fights you've done in terms of food, the GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms, and the the labeling about that, the additives, uh, packaging, but the whole history, you know, how this is agribusiness has insinuated itself into the legislative process was absolutely fascinating to me. That's right, and you do see a lot of the effects of that here in New Mexico, for instance, the uh, uh, factory dairy farms that are using too much water and producing too much waste. So there are a lot of local impacts and a lot of ways that we need to really work both on the way that uh, we eat for our health and for the environment, but also on changing the politics of food. Uh, one of the other local issues is genetically modified green chili. You could probably do anything to New, uh, New Mexican, but you do not mess with our green chili. That is very problematic. And, um, of course, we're very disappointed after all of the years of work 
that um, many organizations, local grassroots groups, have done to try to label genetically engineered food that we weren't able to do that this year. So it's very important to uh, keep the eye on these issues that can really be dealt with at a local level. And let's hope that we can keep the green chili from being uh, uh, genetically <laughs> modified. Yeah. yeah. So you're here on a, a national book tour for your new book, Fracopoly, the battle for the future of energy and the environment. And again, the amount of work and the, the scientific citations are so thorough in this book. I need to address the opoly part of your two books, foodopoly and, and fracopoly. So this is obviously a Greek word meaning. Well, uh, it means uh, in today's political system that there's too much political power in the hands of uh, too few. And that's one of the things that we have certainly found in working on these issues at Food and Water Watch. And I think it's why in the very beginning of our nation that Thomas Jefferson was concerned about monopoly. He actually wanted to put freedom from monopoly in the Bill of Rights, which didn't end up happening. He wasn't concerned about consumer prices. He was concerned about what happens when a a handful of economic interests have too much political power. And, of course, that's what's happened to our democracy really beginning in the 1980s when we have not had a, uh, a vigorous uh, antitrust enforcement and, in fact, our uh, regulations around antitrust or allowing mergers and acquisitions uh, were eviscerated. And since that time, we really haven't had any appetite in this nation for preventing um, companies, industries, from getting too consolidated. And uh, nowhere is this more true than in the uh, energy industry. Yeah. And that's why one of the reasons that I wrote this book in light of climate change and the amount of political power that these interests have, um, they're really writing the future of the planet. Um. Tell me, the, the, you, I've heard you speak about many of the reasons that you wrote this book. So that is one reason. What are some of the other reasons that you spent how many years writing I, this I book? I spent uh, over two years uh, writing that book. And when it was completed, it was actually longer. I had to cut it. But I really went back and looked at a lot of the history. So the first third of the book is about history and the interesting battles that have gone on that have allowed the energy industry to get this much power. But in the end, um, what I really came to the conclusion that we have to take immediate action to keep fossil fuels in the ground, and that this idea that we're going to turn to natural gas as a bridge fuel is sending us in the very, very wrong direction. So. Rather than uh, it's promoted that this would be a bridge f fuel toward renewables, but why not just move more quickly toward renewables because the technology is there and the renewable resources are there? Well, that's actually uh, the point of the book. And in the short term, energy efficiency is really the bridge fuel. Becoming more energy efficient uh, creates jobs. It means we use less energy. It means uh, this is better for the environment. Uh, and there isn't a lot of appetite to save energy and a lot of incentives not to save energy. Now, we know that natural gas isn't a bridge fuel because um, the financial services industry, the fossil fuel industry, are cooperating on a venture to build the infrastructure for another 40 plus years uh, of use of fossil fuels. And they're using their political power to um, actually incentivize the use of gas. So in the short term, since 2012, 80% of fracking has been for oil. But the big energy companies like Exxon, who have gotten into natural gas production, they see this as the way to be able to continue uh, drilling and fracking into the future. We have to define fracking. 
Yes. So fracking is a, a, a set of technologies that really came to the forefront around the turn of the 21st century. We often hear industry say, oh, we've been fracking for 50 or 60 years. Well, the technology to drill horizontally, um, to use this high-pressure mixture of chemicals, water, and uh, sand just didn't exist. Yes, they used water in horizontal drilling. But what fracking is, is drilling as much as a mile, um, under, or two miles underground, rather, um, a vertical well, and then drilling a horizontal well as much as another two miles, and this well is about 20 inches wide. And then they take uh, about 50 times more water than is used in conventional drilling. The national average is 1.8 million gallons per well, and uh, as much as 13 million gallons in, in some parts of the country. They take this water, they use uh, a number of chemicals. There are a thousand different chemicals that can be used, and very fine sand. And this mixture is injected underground in uh, under very high pressure, and this is done in different stages along the horizontal well to fracture this very hard rock uh, shale and to release the oil and gas. And honestly, nobody really knows what's going on that deep underground and what kind of pathways are being created as this fracturing occurs. And then because you're also using so much water, often in very dry areas of the country, much of that wastewater comes back up to the surface and has to be dealt with. And a lot of the poisonous brines and radioactive materials that are deep underground also come up uh, with that wastewater. And so this is one of the ways that a lot of the pollution uh, is occurring. Um. Tell me about the Energy Act where Dick Cheney had a fracking exemption, that they don't have to reveal the chemicals that are used in fracking. Well, that's right. And in 2005, the Energy Policy Act really uh, incentivized fracking by exempting the oil and gas industry from the Safe Drinking Water Act. And um, the oil and gas industry had already been exempted from the 1980s in um, having to meet standards around radioactivity. So um, this causes a lot of problems. And there were other uh, benefits to the oil and gas industry that were part of that legislation, empowering a federal agency, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to override states and localities in the building of pipelines. And um, this agency, which of course is very favorable to the oil and gas industry, also gets to see um, the environmental assessments that are required under federal law. So we basically have the fox watching the hen house. Um, which has come to a, a, a term called sacrifice zones. So what happens if there's fracking next door, for example? You're well, at a rancher, you're out in the country, this moves in next door. Yes. Well, first of all, all I want to say that this is where food and energy policy connect. Mm -hmm. but because of our dysfunctional food system and the um, difficulty that farmers have in making a living, it's very easy for the oil and gas industry to come in and um, purchase um, the right to uh, drill. So this sets up a situation where um, some people have um, own their mineral rights, some people don't own their mineral rights. It is possible that some people make money uh, from, from fracking. But what happens in the community is that often people's water is polluted with methane. Um, the chemicals uh, get into uh, the surface and groundwater, and people get sick. And we have found that the 15 million people who live within a mile of fracking operations, that includes wells, compressor stations, processing facilities, the air is extremely polluted. And um, that's leading to a range of diseases as well. 
asthma, all sorts of respiratory um, problems, um, fatigue. Um, there are now more than 550 studies, most of them done since 2013, 90 percent of them uh, showing some kind of impact from living near a fracking uh, facility. And um, even in the last year, we've seen prestigious universities like Johns Hopkins uh, Public School of Health come out with studies showing that there um, people, women who live near uh, fracking operations have higher rates of miscarriages and uh, all sorts of uh, difficulties with their pregnancies. Also that uh, there's a higher incidence of these respiratory diseases. So there are a lot of impacts. And unfortunately, um, before President Obama was uh, facing his last election, the investigations in three states, Texas, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania, about water pollution um, were shut down, or in the case of Wyoming, turned over to the state. So there hasn't been a real appetite to follow up on a lot of these water pollution issues. We're speaking today with Winona Hatter about her book, Fracopoly. <clears throat> and all the science that you mentioned, you can find references for here. So if people have issues with any of this, the facts are in here. You know, it's, it's hard work. It's very intellectually challenging to read through these long papers, but it's really important. Well, the popular imagination, I think of the movie Gasland, where they actually turn on the tap, put a match to the water, and the water catches on fire. So there are images like that that are so compelling. You know, yes, the science is important, but when you see that these people can then, they can't use their water for the family in their home. They can't use it for their agriculture. And in effect, their ranch or farm is now rendered useless, and they can't sell it because the water is gone. Well, that's one of the things that we've really found in talking to and working with people on the front lines of fracking. When fracking happens and these abuses uh, come to light, water's polluted, people get sick, then the real estate industry in that community completely dies. And we have um, seen a number of people just walk away. Now, one of the things that I learned about the oil and gas industry is this has always been one of their, one of their strategies. Um, it's these lawsuits against industry practices, they consider the cost of doing business. They set aside a certain amount of money to um, actually settle these um, lawsuits. Usually they don't go to court. And people are desperate. Obviously, if your child is sick, if you're sick, uh, if your water is uh, catching on fire, you want to get out of there. Now, what happens is that the industry requires people, if they take the money, to sign a disclosure statement. Mm. And we have long uh, been calling for an investigation of this uh, by Congress and hearings and an investigation. And um, it would be possible even to bring a lot of these impacted people to Washington and take their testimony behind closed doors. But there's not the appetite for that. And let me say one thing about the methane that is leaking into people's uh, water. What happens is the oil and gas industry has always had a lot of cement failures around their wells. And these accidents occur for different reasons. But often it has to do with the use of this high pressure liquid and the effect on the cement casing that surrounds the well um, and goes down fairly deep and around the mouth of the well. There is a high incident of failures. That's one of the ways that the uh, pollution occurs. Another way, way that it occurs is that they just don't do a good job of the drilling in the first place, and they hit an aquifer. Uh, they don't drill deep enough. There are so many ways that accidents can happen, and it's really impossible to regulate uh, all of the problems that arise from these different scenarios. Well, that's on the uh, <clears throat> uh, creation end of this thing, but also on the disposal of the wastewater 
Um, we just we're running out of time quickly, but I want to talk about Oklahoma, the earthquakes. And so if you say <clears throat> one well takes maybe 1.3 million gallons of water, so they force it down there, it comes back up, they've got this extremely polluted product. Now, in some states, they have evaporation ponds, and then they let it evaporate. But in some places, they re-inject it back into the earth. What has happened in Oklahoma because of this? Well, this is causing earthquakes in states like Oklahoma and um, a, a number of states, but Oklahoma is really ground zero for this. They did not have these uh, high magnitude earthquakes. In fact, maybe they would have one to three, uh, 3.0 magnitude earthquakes before the fracking boom there. Last year, they had 851, a uh, three plus magnitude earthquakes. Um, this fall, fall of 2016, they had an earthquake that was 5.8 magnitude. And if you look at the statistics in 2015 for all earthquakes in, Earth, uh, in Oklahoma, they had more than 5,000. So, and this is not something that we dreamed up, that this is coming from the injection, deep injection of wastewater. The Geologic Service has confirmed this. So um, in the time that remains to us, first of all, I want people who, who want to study this, your book, Frac Fracopoly, is such a resource. But there we have to look for solutions. I know in Foodopoly you said, well, you kind of can't vote with your fork. But in energy, what can we do? And is there the political will? We've been through a very intense political season, and a lot of these issues have been superseded by other ones. What can we as individuals do, and what can we as a nation do? Well, I think there are both things that we have to do politically. So um, we are going to have to hold our elected officials accountable and demand that climate change is taken seriously. And of course, natural gas in the short term is an almost 90 times more potent green greenhouse gas. And so we're going to have to have a, um, a, a climate mobilization that's on par with what happened uh, to win World War II or to put a man on the moon. Of course, we can all take personal action as well in making our homes more energy efficient, driving uh, vehicles, since we're talking about oil, so vehicles that have a, uh, um, a very high mileage per gallon of gas. And what we really need to do is keep fossil fuels in the ground, and so we're going to have to move to renewables uh, on the, uh, very quickly. And of course, people, some people have the ability to put solar panels on their house. Uh, we can also, though, at the uh, municipal level, put a lot of pressure on our municipal government to do a lot of the things, uh, change building codes to make it easier to put solar on our homes. So I think it's going to be a combination of political action and some personal action to really um, do what we need to do to keep fossil fuels in the ground. But we are so easily seduced by cheap energy. And the fracking has made it so that we are now one of the, an exporter of energy, not just an importer. And who doesn't love going and paying under $2 for a gallon of gas instead of four? Right. I think we have to take the long view. And we have to educate ourselves about all of the impacts. And it really is going to take a, an organized voting block to put pressure on our elected officials. And I think that um, that's something that can happen at the local level. Surely, looking forward to the 2018 elections, we need to begin organizing now to put that kind of pressure and to have people run for office who are really interested in making these changes. I think at the state level, because a lot of these changes can begin at the state level, we need to look to the next round of um, congressional districting that we know happens every 10 years and to um, begin the 
kind of political pressure that it's going to take to have a, a more fair um, congressional district so that we can really begin to make these changes. And I know that's one of our goals at Food and Water Watch. We want to begin to empower people to get elected who are actually going to take the action that we need in the next 10 to 15 years to stop climate chaos. This is about what kind of planet we want to leave for our children. And the whole climate change issue is, is very, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are very re resistant to it. What I've noticed is that the insurance companies who are having to pay for the cost of these billion dollar hurricanes and the huge floods in Louisiana, the insurance companies, you know, a very conservative base are saying, we notice that something's happened. We can't afford to to deny this anymore because we're having to pay billions of dollars. So they have written an awareness of climate change into their policies because, you know, it's a pocketbook issue for them. They just can't rebuild everybody's houses or get rid of mold in everybody's houses. So um, you urge us to do uh, more work with renewables and to develop the political will to look at these um, issues. And so I want to thank you. Our guest today is Winona Howder, the Executive Director of Food and Water Watch, author of this book, Fracopoly, The Battle for the Future of Energy and the Environment. If you want to read a well-researched book, and if you've got questions about this, they're all in here, you know, all the citations, all the studies. So I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. It is. It is. Uh, what will you be working on next? Well, I think I will be working on our campaigns to keep fossil fuels in the ground and to have a more fair uh, food system. Yes. Oh, well. Thank you for all you do. And I'm Lorraine Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.